scholars, ladies and gentlemen, His Excellency Rigadi Gashagwa. Please be seated. Uh, thank you very much, our Minister for Education, our PS for Higher Education, the Governor of Muranga County, Kangata Wabarua, members of Parliament, comrades, comrades power, power. comrades power. power. First and foremost, let me take this opportunity on my behalf of that of my delegation to apologize to all of you for being late and for having kept you waiting. It is not in my habit to keep people waiting. I am very conscious about time and I keep time in all my public engagements. But we had a function in Maragua, opening a meal for our coffee farmers. And the coffee farmers engaged me for too long. And being our elderly parents, we don't ignore them. I sat to listen to them, and that is why we were late. And I really want to thank you for the patience and to say that next time when you invite us, we'll come on time. Again, let me take this opportunity to the Vice Chancellor and members of the teaching staff and all the comrades for inviting me here for a public lecture on youth uh, leadership and development to engage with you on matters leadership. Let me say from the beginning, President William Ruto and I are strong believers in the youth of this country. We believe in our young people. The President and I are convinced beyond reasonable doubt that the future of this great republic rests on our young people who, as the Vice Chancellor has rightly put it, are 75% of our population. Any conversation about Kenya, the Kenyan state, the Kenyan nation, without talking about our youthful population, that discussion is not complete. Again, it is my joy to be in this great institution to engage young minds because I was at the university many years ago, as you have heard, and young people bubble with the knowledge. And in our course of duty every day, sometimes we get a bit rusty because we don't get time to read, we don't get time to get involved in academic discussions. So when you get an opportunity to engage with young people, you actually feel a bit youthful. So I'm here to feel a bit youthful by engaging with you. And when I was studying biology, if I remember correctly, there were two processes. One was called diffusion, another one was called osmosis. And I want you today, through diffusion and osmosis, to transfer some youthfulness to me so that I feel a bit better we move together. Why do we talk about youth leadership? All great leaders all over the world, at one time or another, were young people. Leadership is not inherited. Leadership is nurtured. We want our young people to take their right of place in society, in all spheres, in political leadership, in leadership in the financial sector, in leadership in our industries, in leadership in our social organizations. The youth of this country, including must take their right of place in leadership. And nobody will come for you from your mother's house to make you a leader. Nobody will come for you and say, oh, 
the daughters of so and so, please come and be our leader. Oh, the son of so and so, please come and lead this organization. No. It is yourself who will go out there and find your place in an organization of your choice and fight through and work hard and lead that organization. I've come this afternoon to tell you that the future of this great country is in your hands and this country depends on you to take your rightful role in leadership. And I've come here to encourage you that it is possible. And I will be giving you my journey so that you know, even yourself seated here, one day you can stand here as Deputy President of the Republic of Kenya. I want you to know that one of you here can be at the Supreme Court as Chief Justice and the President of the Supreme Court. I want you to know among here, one of you can be the Chief of Staff and the Head of Public Service. I want you to know that the Sant is here, one of you can be the Director of Medical Services. I want to persuade you that it is possible for one of you to be the Chief Executive Officer of the Equity Group of Companies. I want you to know that among you here, it is possible for one of you to be the Chief Executive Officer of East African Breweries. It is possible. And I want to tell you why. Or you don't think it is possible. It is not possible. This guy standing here was born in a small village 59 years ago in a grass-thatched house in a village called Herega, a colonial village. There had a big trench that had been dug by the colonialists to stop the local people from getting out of the village. His father and his mother were peasants with no education at all. He was born in a family of nine and he wore his first pair of shoes in 1978 when he went to Form 1 in Kenyaga High School. Those days, it was a luxury for young boys to wear other pants because their parents could not afford them. They had better things to do. This guy seated here wore his first underwear in Form 1 called 007. And all the boys, to show off that they had had a wear, they would pull it up and have the trouser down. And I have seen that is coming back. I don't know where it is coming from. And in the midst of financial struggle, the parents of this guy here struggled to take him to school. And by God's grace, he was able to go to Form 1, pass his Form 4 exams, go to Form 5 and 6, get admitted to the University of Nairobi, and get a job. And through hard work, praying to God, being focused, became a district officer in the government, worked hard, became an assistant secretary, continued working hard, became the personal assistant to the head of public service, Professor Philip Mbithi, continued working hard and being focused and praying God, became personal assistant to President Uhuru Kenyatta when he was the leader of official opposition, continued working hard, became a successful businessman, right alone sought for office, became a member of parliament, and today, by God's grace, is the deputy president of the Republic of Kenya. It is possible. It is possible. And I want to give you a few tips in leadership. Because I want to invite you to become leaders. I'll be introducing to you at the end of the lecture. A few young leaders have come with here. And why the president and I have agreed that we need to do a little bit more in mentorship. It was our desire to mentor our young leaders who are elected. 
But we decided that is not enough. Kenya is too huge. There are too many young people with potential for leadership. And if we just concentrate on mentoring the elected leaders, we miss a point. I have today begun here in Muranga University a long journey across our institutions of higher learning in the entire country to try to attempt to mentor our young people to become the leaders of this country. First and foremost, in whatever sphere that you aspire to lead, there are a few things that are a must. One, you must be God-fearing because those that you lead want a figure who carries with him or her the attributes of mercy, the attributes of understanding, the attributes of empathy, the attributes of being forgiving. And that comes with those who fear God. Number two, the Bible tells us that you must respect your parents, your father and mother, so that the Lord can bless you. There is no way you'll be a leader of any shade in this country, in whatever sphere, when you don't respect your parents. People look at you the way you treat your parents. Any time, even here when you have your elections for student leadership, I've seen the president here. You study that person. If that leader has no respect for his parents, that leader who aspires to lead will not get the favor of the people. And by parents, it does not just mean your biological parents. You must respect people who are the age of your parents. You must show respect to your elders. You must show respect to your seniors. You must show respect to your professors and your lecturers. You must show respect to members of the subordinate staff. Because it all boils down to respecting your parents. In an African setup, anybody, the age of your parents is your parent. And that is very, very important attribute in leadership. Again, the issues of being consistent are critical. What you say on Monday, you must repeat on Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday. You cannot say one thing on Monday and say a different thing on Tuesday. Your word must have value. And we must not be reckless with words. I know in our lives, all of us have been through that stage. Most of you are in that stage. You jokingly, when you are trying to tune a girl, tell her that you marry her. Please don't unless you intend to. It's a very serious commitment. You are trying to talk to a girl, to entice her, to be your girlfriend, to be your long life partner. You have just met her for two days, and then you are telling her you are going to marry her. And you have hardly known her. And you actually don't mean it. It is unacceptable. The day you want a position of leadership, and you promise other things, that girl you promised you'd marry and you had no intention will say that guy is a liar. Let's be, let our words have value. If you say, I will do this for you, before you do, think it through. Think it through. And only when you are sure, you'll do it. When you are sure, you will deliver on that promise then go ahead and pronounce yourself. Matters integrity. The preparation for leadership is based on integrity. If 
when you are in primary school, you used to take the pencil of your desk mate when he or she is not there and it disappears. Later on in life you want to lead, that matter will come to haunt you. You must carry yourself with integrity and dignity. And you must be above board in all your actions. You must agree to reap only where you are sown. You cannot have the habit of taking what does not belong to you and then expect people to allow you to lead them. People will fear you. You must have what belongs to you. And if for whatever reason you want something that doesn't belong to you, please ask your friend to give you or to lead you. But don't take away things that don't belong to you. And that brings us to the whole issue of corruption in our Kenyan state. Many public servants have taken upon themselves to use their positions to unfairly enrich themselves for the detriment of the Kenyan people. And you find when you are being given a position of responsibility, instead of using that position for the public good, you want to use that position to enrich yourself, your friends, your family, your acquaintances. I want to persuade you this afternoon that as one of the strongest ways to prepare for leadership is to be a man and woman of integrity. I want to persuade you this afternoon, as we move on, that another important attribute of leadership and those who aspire to be leaders is courage. You cannot lead people. You cannot lead an organization when you are coward. Leadership is not for the faint-hearted. Leadership is not for cowards. Leadership are for men and women who are courageous. You must, in a very steadfast way, stick to what you believe in. And don't let anybody intimidate you when you have taken a certain position. Think through what you want to do. Interrogate whatever position you want to take. Apply the pros and cons and decide what is good. Once you have decided what is good, stick to it to the end. President William Ruto and I have taken a position on consumption of illicit brews and abuse of drugs. That position is unpopular with 3% of Kenyans. And they shout very loudly. And they have a lot of money and a lot of resources. Drug barons are very strong people. I was at the coast and they were trying to intimidate me. They have serious money. They can bribe their way. They can even have you killed. They can arrange a car accident for you. They can organize for you for your food to be poisoned. But once you take a decision that you have applied your mind, that it is the benefit of the Kenyan people, is the ben to the benefit of mankind, be a courageous person. Defend what you believe in courageously and publicly take a stand that this is my stand. And nobody can intimidate me from that stand. That way, you gain respect. You gain admiration. And any time you pronounce yourself on another topic, you are believable. But if you take a position in the morning on a certain matter, then you are confronted by three, four comrades in the afternoon. And you are told, Wewe, utakutara na sisi. Then you change your mind. Your journey to leadership is curtailed because nobody can take you seriously. 
I want to urge you, comrades, that the word focus is a very important word. You must focus. You must decide what is it that you want to do in life. If you decide you want to be a Catholic nun, it's a very difficult decision. It's a difficult decision. Or a Catholic father for that matter. But once you decide that is your calling, and that is the way you want to go, you must persuade your soul and your heart that that's what you believe in and that is what you want. And focus on that one. And don't be disrupted by anybody. Don't be distracted from your focus. There are people here, probably you want to be a doctor. But in the discussions in the library, when you are having your meals, comrades discuss how difficult the course in medicine is. And you start wondering whether you made the right decision. You have lost focus. I'm also asking too many people to give you an opinion on the decision that you have made. You are lost. The minute you make a decision and you focus on what you want to do and where you want to go, once that decision has been made, please don't seek opinion of anybody on that matter. The minute you seek opinions of others, you will never get anywhere and you know it. If you decide you want to buy a matatu and you have the money you are going to the shop, on the way you ask people, should I buy a matatu? Oh, no, 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 please don't. A lorry is better. Another, no, 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 you, you put a saloon. No, no, saloon, no, no, there, there are too many manenos there. Forget about saloon. Why don't we go to the casino and uh, play with this money? You are lost. You are lost. And people have all sorts of ideas. And those who do nothing have the best ideas. There is nothing they can decide themselves. Their work is to criticize the ideas of others. True or false? Don't listen to idlers. And don't seek their opinion. But take your time. Don't make a decision in a hurry. Take your time. Once you decide what you want, go for it. And don't be distracted. I have a lot of admiration for President William Ruto. When he decided he wanted to be president of Kenya, and many obstacles were put on his path, the guy was focused. People are shouting at him, no, you can't, this is impossible. You don't have the system. You don't have the deep state. How can you make it? The guy said, I'm, an, I'm a man on a mission. And no retreat, no surrender. I am a man on a mission. I have decided that I feel I'm qualified to lead the Republic of Kenya as president. That is my focus. And he's stuck there. Many people persuaded him otherwise. People came and told him the journey you have started is impossible. Please drop it. You can't make it. He said, I'm a man on a mission. And by being focused, by sticking to the script, today, William Samoy Ruto, son of a person, is the president of the Republic of Kenya. I want to persuade you today that whatever calling that you choose, whatever that you decide you want to do in life, please, once you have decided, don't allow anybody to persuade you otherwise. Let me also say that in leadership, the journey to leadership calls for a lot of sacrifice. 
people are happy to be led by people who sacrifice for others. The leadership journey is a difficult one and sometimes lonely. But those that you lead and those you aspire to lead want to know that you have the heart to sacrifice for others. So sometimes in leadership, you may be positioning yourself for the position of the CEO. But you find another more qualified brother or sister. And you decide to sacrifice and let the other one proceed. People normally take that one very kindly. The ability to sacrifice for others. Again, in matter of sacrifice, leadership costs for a lot of time. You cannot want to lead and you cannot sacrifice. You are luxurious outgoings. You want to be the president of the University Council here in Moranga, yet you cannot spend time listening to the comrades and their issues. You want to go every weekend to Nairobi for a movie. It will not work. Leadership calls for a lot of sacrifice. And if you are not willing to sacrifice some things that are very dear to you, you will get into difficulties. These leaders here can tell you. This leadership is about sacrifice. We sacrifice a lot so that you have time to serve other people. You have time to lead people. And leadership calls for a lot of time. So as we ask you to aspire to lead in all spheres of influence, it's important that we put you on notice that leadership is about sacrifice. As the English say, you cannot eat your cake and have it at the same time. You cannot be a leader and you have all the time to yourself, the one that you used to have before you became a leader. It is important that you know so, so that as you proceed in whatever that you do, you appreciate. Let me, in a very simple way, tell you that matters humility. are very, very important ingredients in leadership. Once you have been given opportunity to lead, one of the things that you must do, you must exhibit a lot of humility. Because leadership is about humility. It's called servant leadership. You cannot be given a position to lead people, then you talk down to them and abuse them and shout at them. You must humble yourself before those that you lead. Indeed, you must aspire to be first among equals. That you are a team leader, you are not a boss. This issue of being a boss is very destructive. Leadership is about being a team leader where you lead others and you are the team leader. You are the first among equals. I think there is a novel I, used, I read by Jeffrey Archer called First Among Equals. You are just there, but you are leading the others. So as you aspire to lead in the various spheres, I want to persuade you that you must be prepared to exercise humility. So that when you are given that opportunity, you appreciate that, that opportunity you have been given by other people. I want to give you a few examples of great leaders who are very young so that you know it is possible. President Mwai Kibaki, the greatest president of our times, 
that great economist from the London School of Economics, became the Minister for Economic Planning and Finance at the age of 31. A brilliant man at the age of 31. And he rose to be Vice President and to be the third president of our great republic. Mike Baki remains a very inspiring figure in our country's political development. But I'm most concerned about the age at which he came to leadership. And I want to persuade you that it's possible with you as well. Kenneth G. Domatimba, a man from this great county of Ranga. In fact, he was an MP for this constituency. It was called Biri then. Became a permanent secretary at the age of 30. And he rose through the ranks to lead the Kenya Football Federation, to be a very senior minister of government, and to own a chain of hotels down at the coast and in Nairobi. And his prominence is still talked about, not just in this county, but in the entire country. Tom Joseph Boyer became the Minister for Justice and Constitutional Affairs again at the age of 31. That flamboyant, eloquent man from the Suba was youthful, had vigor, he was eloquent. And he was one of the brilliant minds this country has ever had before he was assassinated in Moy Avenue in Nairobi. Professor Wangari Mathai became the first woman to have a PhD in this country at the age of 30. She rose be given the Nobel Prize later in life for her efforts in conservation. I want to talk about in entrepreneurship, Dr. James Mwangi entered the Equity Bank just before he was 30. It was a building society that had many challenges with a few branches here in Muranga and a few in Nyeri. A young man determined, focused, a go-getter. Today, the equity group of companies is one of the biggest banks in the African continent. He was a youthful person. Jane Keanu the late wife of Dr. Julius Gekonyo Keanu, another man from this great county, became the chairperson of Maendeleo Yawanawake at the age of 20. She led all the Kenyan women for decades, and she came in at the age of 20. A girl of 20 years, focused, determined, disciplined, and there she was. Field Marshal Mudoni Kirema, the personal assistant to Field Marshal Dedan Kimadu Ashuri, at the age of 18, was a general in the war. She led other gallant freedom fighters in the Abadea forest for the freedom struggle of this country. At the age of 18 years, we buried her the other day. Again, a youthful girl. Brave, courageous, determined, a go-getter. We have Professor Michele Gidae Mugo, who became the first dean in the faculty of us at the University of Nairobi at the age of 36. It was unheard of 
in those days in academia. Again, being focused. I want to tell you, good people, please, please, this is your country. You have the brains, and age is on your side. I wish I could come back to your age. Oh, the things I would do, I don't even want to imagine. Age is on your side. You are youthful, you are energetic, you are vibrant, you are intelligent. And we are here telling you, take your right of place and lead this country. And why not? Whom do you want to lead this country? It is you. But before you do that, you must be alive. For you to lead us, you must be alive. So if you drink this, it is the bruise, you'll be dead. Or you lose your eyesight. Before you can lead, you must be healthy. You must take care of your body and the mind. This mind, if you intoxicate it with illicit bruise, and bangi, and drugs, whom will you lead? I cry for our people. I cry for our young men when I see them sleeping in ditches after taking little illicit bruise. I cry for our university students when I see them taking drugs. There's no future for you. Your parents have brought you here hoping that you'll be somebody someday to take care of yourself and your family and to take care of them in old age and thereafter take care of the society. If you are dead, you cannot take care of them. If you ruin your body through illicit bruise and drugs, you cannot take care of your aging parents. You cannot take care of yourself. So I want to persuade you today. There is time for everything. There is time for everything. First, do your degree and graduate and get a job. If you must drink, have a decent uh, beer to drink. Yeah. And when you can also afford to buy and buy some people a few rounds, you feel good. But this is it nonsense that is being sold around here. This bangi will ruin you, my dear sisters and brothers. I want to plead with you with a lot of humility as your parent, as your father, please, keep off drugs. It is the path to hell. It is indeed the path to nowhere. You'll waste your life and waste your chance to be anybody, not just within your family, but in the country. So I want us to agree from today. Those of you who may be who may be partaking, change your mind. And you can do so. I used to drink a lot myself. Oh, a lot. Beers. A crate, a crate and a half. There is a bar called Citrus uh, next to Jamuri High School. It would be very nice there. There was a one-man guitar there and I have had some little money. So I would stay there up till morning. We drink and drink and drink and get wasted. And many of my drinking buddies, most of them are dead. Others are zombies. <laughs> Others are ruined. They look for me to give them something to eat today. 
But since I made the decision to quit drinking, my path has been rosy. And you can see where I stand today. Please. Please, our young people. I cry for you. President William Ruto cries for you. I've come to talk to you with tremendous respect and humility that your future is bright. Please, don't ruin it. You owe it to yourself, not ruin it. You owe it to your parents, not ruin it. You owe it to society. And you are very advantaged that you have a president and a deputy president who think about our young people and leaders who are willing to create a good atmosphere for you and the right environment to grow. We are willing to mentor you. I, in conclusion, because I'd like to take a few questions, isn't it? In conclusion, you people are very creative. I am a beneficiary of your creativity, myself. When I was elected as deputy president, <coughs> many people found my name very difficult. Many people had difficulty in that name. And some young girl somewhere decided she likes me. She, she likes the way I talk. She is happy I'm a truthful man. I say it as it is. And decided to come up with a name to make life easier for me and my fans. And she came up with Ricky G. <laughs> that girl is here. She's called Ive Chelimo. Come here, they say. I introduce this girl. <laughs> this is a girl full of creativity. This is a girl. Yeah? And uh, Ive is a lawyer by profession. Right now, she works in my office in the communication department. And uh, she helps me around feeling and looking youthful. And she's doing a good job, isn't she? She is full of creativity. You want her number, you guys? You want her number? I had again 0722778495. Okay, Ivan. Thank you. Clap for her. <laughs> uh, finally, so that I can take a few questions. If you want to be a leader, you must be brutally honest. Brutally honest. You must say it as it is, and you'll be respected. When we were sworn in, on 13th of September, I was given a chance to say something. <laughs> I said it, didn't I? Didn't I? I say the kind of economy we have inherited. I say the country is broke. There is nothing. Even the stores are empty. Even the rats have run away. There is nothing to eat. And people say this regarding Gashagwa is a very mischievous person. How can he talk that way in front of visitors? But later, five, six months down the line, I was predicted what I had said. Had I not told the people of Kenya the truth on that day, President William Ruto and I would have been blamed for being unable to turn around the economy. But I said it as it was. It has taken the president one and a half years of sheer hard work being focused, working day and night to turn around the economy. As we speak today, the shilling is gaining against the dollar from 162 to 134. We found the price of unga 
at 240 shillings. It has come down to 125, 130. Last week, petrol and diesel came down by seven shillings. And, and the economy is showing signs of recovery. And I want to assure you, because I'm a truthful person, the future looks bright. Future looks bright. <laughs> President William Ruto has a great plan for this country, and I assist him as his principal assistant in the management of the affairs of this country. And I can tell you from where I sit, that guy works hard, he's focused, he is determined, and he's not distracted. And it is for that reason this Kenya is going places. And I want you to walk with us that journey. Asante Nisana, thank you very much. Um, maybe we can, if we can take a few questions, I'll be very, very happy to, to answer, because it's good. Who is moderating? Nandi, I'm going to microphone up now. This. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you so much to our Deputy President, His Excellency Right Honorable Rigadi Gashagwa. Uh, allow me to stand here kindly. Yeah, please. Okay. Uh, uh, to our Deputy President, Right Honorable Rigathe Gashagwa, and his entire entronage, protocol observed, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, good evening, sorry. Uh, Your Excellency, before I further proceed, allow me to take a second or two to convey my heartfelt Condolence to the bereaved family and friends of those who got uh, uh, the fatal accident recently from KU. Uh, I'm Denzel Bruce Juma from Homer Bay County, and uh, I'm very much impressed with your office under the office of the advisory led by Honorable George uh, Theory. He's doing quite tremendous work there. However, sir, I had a concern on the Hustler Fund, okay, with a situation that a comrade uh, wants to borrow 500 shillings, and maybe he's pursuing communication science. He has a, a target of maybe purchasing a camera. Uh, so if this guy borrows 500, Your Excellency, for how long will he reach even 20,000 to acquire the camera. And maybe this comrade is coming from a very, very low life family that if he or she tells the parent, the parent will outdo the camera for fees. Okay? So now that you have a foundation, a robust foundation for that matter, Your Excellency, how is your office going to assist in such a menace? As I, as I conclude, because you have also proven to be a father figure of many, I want to say that God willing come 2032, if God gives us life, I will support you with all my body parts and organs. <laughs> you have my vote, you have my vote, Asante Sara, I will support you. And when I go back to home away, I'm going to tell them <laughs> and I'm going to be your number one whistleblower in that <laughs> county. Asante San. Uh, thank you very much. The Hustler Fund is a well thought out strategy by President William Ruto on financial inclusion. What has been happening in this country is that the people at the bottom of the pyramid who are the majority 
did not have access to credit because of the requirements to borrow money from banks. You either need a title deed or you need a logbook, which most Kenyans don't have. The Hustler Fund is a 50 billion fund by the government of the Republic of Kenya. And it is a fund that is administered based on trust. Why the fund started low at 500 shillings is because most Kenyans, not most, a few Kenyans are not honest. They are not. We are being truthful. So we say, let's start this fund this way. You borrow 500, you pay. You borrow again, you pay. You are upgraded to 1,000. You borrow 1,000, you pay. You are upgraded to 2,000. Like that, like that, you become credit worthy. So that your behavior in matters integrity is confirmed. People have borrowed now about 35 billion, and they have, most of them have paid. A few characters who, followed, who borrowed 500, they changed the SIM card and disappeared. <laughs> but that is the Kenyan state. That is the Kenyan state. So I want to say, for people who have integrity, for people who do not want to reap where they have sold, the Hustler Fund is a good fund. Just borrow continuously paying and you upgrade your limit. There are now people who are borrowing 20,000. Groups are borrowing between 50,000 up to a million shillings. But you must build that history that you are somebody who can be relied on. In any case, these are public funds. And these funds belong to the Kenyan people. And they must be paid. So I want to encourage you, my brother. If you are still at 500 after one year, that is a bit sad. I want you to borrow 500, borrow 1,000, 1,500, and go upgrading your limit, and it will be able to help you. As for your wishes to me, I want to thank you. Tell the people of Homabe, before they can even support me, who agree that this time round we all support President William Ruto beyond. Then you begin to talk about that. Next one. Thank you, Your Excellency. My name is Michelle Njero. Nani? Michelle Njero. Sawa. <laughs> My you know, name is... you know, you know, I'm from the village, eh? That English is too tough for me. I'm sorry. <laughs> but I've gotten it. Michelle General Sawa? Yes. Very well, proceed. My name is a statement, most importantly, on the regarding the Gashango Foundation. We, are co we as the university students and the youths at large, we are experiencing a calamity. 37.9% of the youths are undergoing depression, anxiety, and most leading to suicide. We are looking forward that your foundation will consider putting, putting mental health programs for the mentorship despite being given the growth system. We should also be taught on how to move, manage our mental health and develop as young leaders. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Comrades Power. I'm Nyaga Onesmas, the Sec Jane Moranga University. And I have a concern, His Excellency, on matters pertaining the youth leadership and mentorship. So my question was, what are the strategies that you are going to put in place? to monitor and evaluate the effectiveness of the youth leadership and mentorship programs in promoting the, over, the overall well-being of all youth 
across the country. Number two, what are the initiatives that the government is going to undertake to empower young leaders and foster mentorship opportunities nationwide, mostly in our universities and colleges in that matter. To conclude, it's a suggestion, not a question. Uh, in our universities and in most cases, we have units we have as a university and comrades in large. So my concern was, let this meeting and this lecture in Muranga University of Technology be the first one to champion the youth leadership and mentorship program by introducing a unit in the universities pertaining the same in all university. <laughs> We better <coughs> Okay. His Excellency. Thank you. Next. His Excellency. Instead of having a unit HIV and AIDS, personally I would consider having a unit in leadership rather than a unit in HIV. Eight. Comrades power. Asante ni sana. Okay, last one. My name is Nelin Morugi Ireri. I'm from Embu County. Of course, I want to acknowledge that the chair of UDA is my mom from Embu County. From Nikujitu, that your government is very serious about women leadership, increasing the G7 to G16, High Excellency Waigoro talks about G24. So my question is, when I revise the history of Kenya, the national government used to take the campus leadership very serious. So my question is, what are you doing for us as student leaders? The next time, what are you guys doing? The next question is, a, is to my MP. What are you doing? We are coming for a long holiday. I have students whose mother are from Shauri. They won't come to sell drugs with their mother in Shauri. What are you doing? The last thing, I want to say that Mokonje, I know umeona tuki dance hapa wa embu, au kuona jua ni sisi, ni jua tuna attires, tuki toka hapa, kindly, I need attires for embu dance. Thank you very much. I think... Um, a question from Michelle. Let me answer those ones first. She has raised a very fundamental issue. The issue of depression. The issue of suicide. It's a difficult issue, not just in campuses, but in the villages. We have had very many suicides as a result of depression. First and foremost, I want to appeal to you not to allow yourself to get into depression. Don't suffer in silence. Reach out to your friends, to your pastor, to your lecturer, and to your parents. Don't agonize alone, because when you agonize alone, the mind is overwhelmed. 
people get into suicidal moments. And one of the ways to deal with such situations is to share out. Never allow yourself to go down when you have something that is disturbing you. I think I want to encourage the university administration to enhance the capacity for counseling so that students who may be undergoing mental pressure have somebody to talk to and somebody who can listen to them. I do agree, I was requested by the president to ask Pastor Dockers, my spouse, who is very good in mentorship and counseling, to come and have a session with you. We are having a program, even in the police force, of chaplaincy and counseling. Even among our police officers, we have lost very many to suicide. And it's a reflection of what is happening in society. So all we can do is, as a government is to enhance our capacity to deal with mental disorders. And we are encouraging the governors, because health is a devolved function, to have a psychiatrist at every level for hospital to be able to give mental help to patients who are suffering. As it is, we are not doing very well because the mental health interventions are only in level five and at the referral hospital in Mathare. So that is a discussion we are having with the governors. But in terms of institutions, I ask the vice chancellor and the, and the council to consider enhancing your chaplaincy and your counseling section so that you can do a little bit more to help students who are in distress. But the real solution lies with you to speak out. Don't suffer in silence. Share with somebody you know who cares for you. And you are intelligent enough to know those who means well. There are certain fellows you can't share your problem with. They will be happy. But you, must, you have the discerning spirit to know who means well for you. Uh, the gentleman asks what we shall do to monitor and evaluate the progress of this mentorship program. We have just started, and from this lecture, the people from my foundation will do follow-up so that we can get a few students We start having a discussion. When we are traveling out of Nairobi, we can carry two or three students so that they go and see the world, what is happening, you know? And I think what I can do for a start is only I don't know how that can be decided. At least I get one student. I'm going to Rwanda next month. I go with one student from here. Just a part of mentorship so that they learn. Yeah, at least I can go with one person to Rwanda for two, three days, then we come back. Just as a measure of exposure, again, a guy said that uh, you don't need a unit in HIV, you need a unit in uh, leadership. We need a unit in HIV. We do. The HIV scourge is complicated more so by consumption of illicit alcohol and drugs. People who are have consuming drugs, most of them are HIV positive. Because the needles pass infection from one person to another. People who are intoxicated by alcohol, all drugs are not able to take care of, them, care, care of themselves and apply preventive measures when they get involved intimately with their partners. So the issue of HIV, much as we want a unit in leadership, I encourage that it continues to give counseling so that it's a challenge to our young population. And the HIV uh, maneno is still a bit worrisome. So we still need that unit, but I don't think there is any harm, VC, with your people to consider courses that you offer 
if there is something in political science or leadership, it does no harm so that we can be able to take our people through. Murugi has asked about women leadership. President William Ruto and I are fans of women, and they don't give us space in our cabinet. They are everywhere. The Secretary to Cabinet is Maso Wanjau. National Security Advisor to the President is Dr. Monica Juma. The CS for Lands, Housing, Urban Planning is Alice Wahome. The CS for Gender and Affirmative Action is Aisha Jumwa. The CS for Environment and Climate Change is Ivan Tuya. The CS for East African Community is Penina Malonza. The CS for um, Social Protection and Labor is Florence Bore. The CS, uh, which is the other CS? The, the CS for Trade, Investment, and Industry. Very senior docket is Rebecca Miano. They are there. All the PSs. The CS for Health, Susan Nakumisha. They are there. We have in our UDA, Kenya Kwanza Formation, we have four governors. We have these women leaders who are here, most elected by the people directly. Our government has place for women. You have said, Ses Barire is a chairperson of UDA, the governor of Embo. In fact, the women are almost driving us out of our positions. You know, we are, actually, we need affirmative action. We, need, we are an endangered species. But for me and the president, we are happy to encourage women in leadership and even among yourselves, young girl. Don't wait for us to come and help you. Leadership. Bila umejitetea hapa, ungangane na wanaume. Huyu, huyu MMP, huyu wa, wa marawa huyu, anaitu wa mere wa maua. Aliangusha wanaume ine. Four, second time. Please, fight for your space. And the space is there. And just fight for your space. But our administration gives that environment. Because we need to proceed to Nairobi, let me introduce the leaders here present.